Jesus is enough for everything that we face in this life. Absolutely everything he is able for everything in this life. In this year that we have going on, we think it can't get any worse, hardly, but we know that it can get worse. But we know this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever and ever and ever and if you want him to he'll show up and show out in your life he'll show up and show out in your life and so we just need to seek his face it says in the prophets in the old testament one of them he says it's time to break up your fallow ground that means hard ground ground that hadn't been plowed for a while. It's time to break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord until He comes. If you pray for five minutes and He doesn't show up, pray five more. If you pray five more and He don't show up, pray some more. If you pray an hour and He don't show up, you say, well, I'm give out. Start over tomorrow and pray again. <laughs> and show up the next day. Great men of faith have had to pray more than one time to get a blessing that God promised. Elijah prayed seven times, seven times to get rain from heaven. And God said at the beginning of this contest, I'm going to withhold the rain and I'm going to send the rain. And you know the showdown that happened on Mount Carmel, he called himself and a few other believers together and they were just watching him and there was 450 prophets of Baal and he said the Lord that answers by fire well they built them an altar and they prayed for more than half a day they prayed with much energy they even had little lancets and they cut themselves and spilled their blood on the ground and finally he says back up guys and then he went and got 12 stones and he set them up he put some wood there and he dug a little trench and as scarce as water was he said no good some water some more and some more and then he prayed 62 or 63 word prayer whatever translation you want to look at and God sent fire down from heaven less than a hundred words but God said that ain't the big blessing I want to do today the big blessing is rain and before he ever saw the cloud in the sky he told King Ahab, get up your chariot, go back before I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And he goes and begins to pray. And you know the story. It took seven times. And then he seen a little, about the size of a man's hand, way off in a distance. He said, it's coming. It's coming. And it come. And it flooded. Jesus wants to do the same today. You can be seated. In between those two doors when you go out, there's a missionary cards out there. The Curtises, Jason and Brittany, and they got a brand new baby that was born in December. Aya, A-Y-A. I may be pronouncing it wrong, but I'm not spelling it wrong. And the baby's only got, got heart defect and it needs a heart transplant. They can't work on it, can't do anything. And so the baby needs that unless Jesus Christ heals that baby. Now, Jesus can heal the baby. I ask you to pray for that baby that Jesus will do a miracle. They are missionaries to Egypt, and uh, they are going back to Egypt as soon as th they had planned to go back, and they just said there's doctors in Egypt. They had planned to go back, and they knew that surgery was going to happen uh, several months or maybe a year later after birth, and they was trusting the doctors in Egypt. They were going back, but they can't. But they, she needs prayer, and the family needs prayer. And uh, they are believing God, and uh, Jason uh, is still itinerating, going around and speaking at churches, raising funds to go back down there. 
he could uh, excuse himself and stay there with his wife and the baby, but keep them in prayer. Jesus Christ is more than enough. We have things so easy nowadays. Uh, we don't have uh, hymn books no more. Whether we sing hymns uh, or we sing choruses, we can put it on the screen. Let me see everybody's Bible. Just let me see it. Some of y'all may hold this up. That's okay. If you don't have one of these, you can put all of your Bible on this. If you got a smartphone, please put your Bible on there. Put your Bible on there. You, you'll need to, to read that from time to time. And um, not being a, a smart aleck, and uh, that's what I told the ladies at Walmart this morning. Uh, I went in to get some donuts for the Sunday school class. And oftentimes they have a dozen donuts in there. And so, and then they have six donuts in another little box. I went in today. You don't have to record this. They, they don't need to hear this nowhere else. <laughs> I went in there today, or you can just put mute. And they had uh, some donuts there, and it says, and I, and I picked it up, and I'm thinking, well, that don't look like 12. And then I said, it don't look like six. They didn't have a single box down there today that had 12 donuts in it, not one. They had some with six and some with eight. And I talked to the lady behind there. I says, I'm just kidding. Time out. I said, I'm just funning with you. I says, but is eight the new dozen? <laughs> you know, sometimes you buy a cereal and it have a 60. Uh, turnip greens. I love turnip greens. And so at Thanksgiving, uh, I, my family lets me uh, cook turnips, me and my wife. And so the turnip greens, we buy them frozen, and they used to come in little bags, and they were 16 ounces. And so in the last two years, we noticed that uh, it took more than eight bags and a cabbage and what else to make it a full box. And we looked at the bag, and now no longer is it 16 ounces, it's 12 ounces, and you pay for the same price. And so I asked her, I said, is eight the new dozen? But <laughs> and she just looked at me. She said, there ain't no 12 donuts over there. I says, no, not anywhere over there is there a box with 12. She just laughed. Um, and so, but um, if you take in math or algebra and you say eight is a new dozen, you will get it marked wrong, okay? <laughs> a view in victory. When I was born again and when you were born again, even before we were born again, God had a view down the road that by the blood of his son Jesus, we would be redeemed. And then after we were redeemed, God had a view in mind that he had the power to get us to the finish line. No matter what the devil was coming at us, he says, I can get you to the finish line. And so as we go through this year, we can look around us and know that in years past, we've had some good starts and then things slowed down a little bit. Whether we're losing weight, whether we have a new desire, going to read the Bible, just understand this. God is able to make us prosperous all the way through the end of the year with our zeal, with winning souls, with praying. In fact, at the end of the year, he can have us more full of zeal than what we are at the current present moment. Power to stand. If Jesus Christ is for us, if he's for you, man, if he's for you, if he's for you, if he's on your team and you're submitting to his leadership, you're going to win. You're going to win because there's no limit to his power. Let's begin in chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. And I'm going, uh, even though I have it printed in here in this larger print, I'm going to read it out of this Bible right here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your waist girded with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I have victory before me. So do you. And in the book of Revel- uh, the book of Romans, close to the end, the Holy Spirit has the apostle write these words. And knowing the time, it is high time to awaken out of sleep. There is a spiritual slumber that is taking place in the church today. Now, it's going to take place in a lot of Christians in the last days, but it don't have to take place in my life, and it don't have to take place in your life. You say, why do, why do you say there's going to be a spiritual slumber? Because Jesus prophesied, and he says this, in the last days, many shall depart from the faith. They shall grow cold in their faith. Also, in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 1, 2, and 3, it makes this statement. One of the things that's going to mark the end right before the Antichrist gets here is a falling away from the faith. Why is that so? It's because people are becoming attracted to the world when we should keep our eyes completely upon Jesus. So the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus speaks to this intent. He says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon this earth where moth and rust corrupts or where you just eventually get so much clutter, you just move it to a bedroom and then you put some more stuff there until you get tired of it and then you move it to a... (laughs) Nobody, Nobody in this room does that. Nobody knows anybody that does that. Nobody knows. But he says this. Don't let your life get so full of clutter and you have nothing in heaven. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where a thief can't even break through and steal. And then he goes a little bit further and he expounds a little bit more and he says, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. For either you're going to fall in love with the one and hate the other one, or you're going to despise one and fall in love with the other one. You just can't serve God and money. You can't do that. And so the Holy Spirit, as Paul is getting to this point in his message, he sees an end in view that it has victory in it for them if they'll just follow the recipe Not his recipe, but the Holy Spirit's recipe that is going to speak there. And so, it's and that knowing the time, it's high time. If I know that there's going to be a lot of Christians that's going to grow cold in their faith, what do I do? Do I say, well, I'm going to be like everybody else? No. You're going to hope to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some people will be. And wherever you gather to hear the message preached on Sundays and Wednesdays in your small groups, wherever, pray that you have a good teacher, a good pastor that's going to tell you the truth. But then what you get on Sunday or Wednesday, or your, it's not enough. It's not enough. As newborn babies... If we want to grow, we need to read this word and find out what God is wanting to put into my heart to make me successful spiritually. I want to be successful spiritually. I don't want to show up to heaven. And nobody is the else is there that can't say, you encouraged me. You led me to Christ. 
Or it may be missions money that God says, the money that you sent to this missionary and put them on the field, you, was, you had a part in winning their soul for Jesus. You don't want to show up and have nothing there. You don't. You don't. And so it's a spiritual conflict that we are facing today. And so this calls for a continual empowering within our life. Peter spoke along these lines. It won't be on the screen, but you can write it down. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. He's speaking about their faith. He says, y'all got faith? Add to your faith virtue, goodness. And then after you got this goodness, add to your faith some perseverance. How many of y'all know that uh, everything's not easy in life? You know that. So when it don't get easy, we just don't try to find an easier way. If there's, only, if there's the right way to go, we pray and ask God to give us the victory, and we just keep going in the right way. And then we need some self-control. And then we need to grow more and more in knowledge. And there's some more things there, but then he finishes up with this. He says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective how many of y'all have has got five years before you retire or 20 years before you retire okay everybody that raised your hands now I don't ask you don't raise it again how many of y'all have got more than enough in your retirement fund you ain't got to worry about nothing you could just retire right now and sit back and just got the money coming in How many of y'all think that maybe you need to work five or ten years longer than what you anticipated? So you, and so Jesus says, if we possess the right kind of qualities in increasing measure, in this love and joy and the perseverance and the endurance, if we have spiritual things in increasing measure, and there's no reason we can't keep increasing, we will be very effective in winning the lost, and we'll be very effective in sharing the joy of Jesus Christ. But if you don't put something in your spiritual tank, we're not going to have anything to get out of the spiritual tank. Happy birthday, Libby Costello. Y'all are listening. Hallelujah. <laughs> so in this pursuit here, we Paul is telling them, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. And so when he says, be strong in the Lord, that means there is a pursuit of, of God. I need to learn more about God so that I can be strong in the Lord. And so in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and in verse number 2 to the church of Colossia, Paul is doing the same thing with them through the Holy Spirit. Paul is writing this letter from prison. He didn't get in prison and says, well, I'm just going to wait for my two years is up or three years. I wait before I go to the judge and he says, I get out of here. While he's in prison, he's hearing what's taking place in Colossians. So he writes a letter down there. He hears what's going on in Ephesians and he writes a letter down there. And he's praying while he's writing this and he's writing the very mind of God. Holy Spirit said, this is exactly what the church of Colossae needs to hear. This is exactly what the church of Ephesus needs to hear. And then he says, those people at Ivan, 2,023 years later from now, they need to hear this too. Isn't it amazing that God knew that you were going to be at Ivan Assembly of God this morning? <laughs> yeah, we were on God's mind. So was the first Baptist. So is the Methodists. So is every believer around this world. God had these words preserved for every believer. They are profitable. And so he says this to the church of Colossia. If you then are born again, if you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Don't try to seek the things of this world that's going to rust and throw away. And whenever we die, we're going to leave it here. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, set your thinking, set your heart on things above and not on things on this earth. I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. I want you. Wednesday night, we closed in prayer. I could ask you how many people in this room know somebody 
that used to know Jesus Christ and have backslid or they never knew Jesus but they sat somewhere, heard a preacher on TV, heard a word witnessed and, they, and they're not following Jesus today. Everybody in this room knows somebody like that. We closed prayer on Wednesday night praying and asking God because in Isaiah, God says, my word never comes back void. It's there cutting and penetrating people's hearts. And so we close Wednesday night praying that those that have backslidden, those that's got cold, that the Holy Spirit would take that word and regenerate it down in their heart because Jeremiah says, is not your word, O God, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? And I was one of those people that had a heart that was hard. Hard. So hard that I said, if I ever get to be 16, I'm quitting school, getting a job. And you know the story. I won't never go to church again. But I want to go to heaven because hell's hot. And I don't want to spend eternity with hell. But I want to spend eternity in heaven. And I didn't want to go to heaven for the right reason. The only reason I wanted to go to heaven because I didn't want to go to hell. But the love, I asked Jesus to come in my heart. Romans 5 verse 5 says this. But the love of God is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit that's given unto us. The day I said, Jesus, come into my heart. The Holy Spirit come in there and he done a miracle. A miracle. It's like the miracle that Jesus, whenever he was with his mother at the wedding of Canaan, they had just water, and, he, and, and then he did a miracle and turned water into wine. When I asked Jesus into my life, he did a miracle, and all of a sudden, and instead of wanting to go to heaven just to get out of hell, I wanted to go to heaven to see Jesus. I immediately started writing verses. Got, I don't know, more than a thousand of these. I immediately began writing little verses on three by five cards. And at the time I was working for a delivery company in Madison, Florida. It's 58 miles from the interstate down here where I got on in Tallahassee at the lows and everything there, all the way to about 58 miles. And so in 58 miles, on an average, every day I could learn, memorize five verses. My mind was much more spry then. Or two or three. And so I immediately, there was a miracle that takes place. If you want to have a new heart, really ask Jesus in there and he'll change it. Everything that you used to hate, you'll start loving. You'll want to be buddies with Jesus. You'll want to be like Jesus. And so, set your minds on things above. There is divine power that God, as we learn of Jesus, learn of Jesus, there is divine power that's given to us through a knowledge of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. It says, Peter says this, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given us, what is divine power? That's God power, not Mr. Clean, but it's God power, divine power. It's the power when you get up to the Red Sea and, and, and they're crying out for deliverance and, and God sends a, a, a strong east wind all night and then he just, and then it opens up. What is divine power? It's whenever you're Peter and you're in prison and Herod's already showed out and killed James and had his head cut off. And he's speaking to you and says, you're next. Divine power is the peace of God that passes all understanding. That Peter is laying down in the floor of that jail cell. And he is asleep and the angel comes in and kicks him and says, get up, put on your clothes. And 
he's looking around, and, and so when he stands up, the chains fall off. It, it is so astronomical, so mind-blowing. It says he went out of the, the first gate, the second gate, and he said he thought he was just having a dream. He said, and then the angel left. <laughs> he says, this is real. So God gives God power, divine power, to those who f that will fill your mind and heart with him. And so we have this, that as Paul starts out here and he's given words, he says, and, and, and we want to have this God power that's in him, in Christ, in us. And so this is the power that delivers. It's unlimited resources. Unlimited resources. There's a verse there. You can write that down, but I'm going to share with you another verse. It's in the first chapter, I think, verse 20, but it's also in Romans chapter number 8. It says, but if the power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Jesus was dead three days and three nights. Jesus was dead like you have never seen dead. Isaiah said he was whipped, bruised, kicked, beat, disfigured so much, Isaiah 53, 1 and 2, in, in the last part of 52, so much that his visage was deformed more than anybody else in the world had ever been. That's why even though the disciples had heard three times, I'm going to rise from the grave on the third day, on the third day, they didn't go to the tomb because they didn't expect Jesus to be alive. He was so messed up. In fact, the women went there just to embalm him some more. But when they got there, he's out. And then when the women come back and said, he is risen, they're like, no, he ain't. Ain't no way. And so they start running and going there. And so we have here that God can put some supernatural divine power. There's unlimited resources to me. So, but if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me and dwells in you, he that raised Christ from the dead will take this sinful body and renew it, re-energize it. So I want to do God's will and I will do God's will in this life. So as I sp face spiritual warfare this year, you can too. You can be victorious through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Lord means I have a relationship with him. We need this divine power. Why? Because the devil is absolutely a schemer. Several years back, they had a chess tournament that had the best of America against the best of Russia. Now, and when they played chess, sometimes it would take them one, two, three or four days to make one move. Why? Because they're trying to get in the mind of their opponent. They're trying to, this is what he's, if I do this, they're going to do this. But if I do this, and they're trying to outsmart you. The devil is a schemer. Now, he has been around for years. He was here before Adam and Eve was created, and he was against God. But in the garden, he just says, I know how I can get Eve. And he got her. He got her. And then... You got two brothers. One is worshiping God. He offers a blood sacrifice. And another one offers another sacrifice. And God comes to Cain and he says, Cain, if you offer the right sacrifice, you will be accepted just like Abel. You'll get the uh, good man, attaboy, child of God. I love you. All you got to do is just do what he did. And he gets sulky. Y'all know what sulky? Give me a sulky look. Come on, that's not hard for some of y'all. <laughs> y'all are a long ways from sulky right now. Come on. And Cain blowed out his lips. And he goes out in the field and he's working with his brother. And his brother's over there probably singing and whistling. I love you, Lord. Jairus enough. And he's over there. And God had spoken to him. He says, sin is crouching at your heart's door. And his desire is to have you. He wants to eat your lunch. He wants to take your life. He wants to destroy your life. Be careful. You are to rule over him. But he gets out there and he begins to listen to stories. 
The devil can give you a thought. He can make you harbor on that thought until you do it or you run him away. And so there never had been a murder in the world. Never. Not, he, what he did was not copycat. Wasn't copycat. And the devil placed it. He says, get you a stick and walk up behind him and just wail him in the head and kill him and bury him. And then you won't have nobody to compare you to do about being righteous. So he killed him and buried him. And God comes up and says, where's your brother? Abel. He says, am I my brother's keeper? He said, your brother's blood is crying out. And so we got to be careful about the thought process that happens in our life because they begin to grow and they can grow into sin in our life. And so, but that, that's not the only way the devil gets into our life. Um, let me see where I'm at. I may have to skip some, um, but uh, let, me talk, let me talk to you about I just talked about a thought process. So you need to hear this because you can't get so saved you don't have a thought process that the devil don't try to plant a seed there. There's nobody here that's so saved. And so we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, the church at Corinth faces these kind of same things. And to show you that Paul's not just copying this letter and another letter and sending the same letter out every way, when he rephrases it to the church at Corinth, he says, the weapons we fight with, they are not natural weapons of this world. On the contrary, the weapons we fight with have divine power. We demolish. Let me stop right there. Divine power. Did y'all enjoy worship this morning? Did some of y'all just enter into worship and begin to uh, praise God in English? And did some of y'all enter into worship and begin to praise God in your heavenly language? And if you didn't, and you, could you just sense the presence of God in the, the presence? You couldn't see God. Now, we're, we're, we're talking also here about principalities of power, demon spirits influencing people. Well, the Holy Spirit was here in the service this morning, and he's influencing minds and hearts and, and he's wanting to influence you but the influence he has within us and tries to have in us when we leave here today he doesn't want that influence to depart from us he wants us to believe that the presence of God will go with us always 24 7 can't see God you don't see the devil when he plants those seeds but he's real and the influence, the power of the Holy Spirit is absolutely so real. So we wage not war. Let's go back to Corinthians. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments. Every pretension. What's a pretension? Man, the devil makes you think you can just get by with it. What kind of pretension do you think you spoke into King David's life? He says, I can do this and get by with it. And the Holy Spirit say, no, you can't. <laughs> you may be totally in charge and totally in power here, but you can't get away from it. That sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Everybody say that. Say, I can take captive. I can take captive every thought. Every thought. I can take captive through the power of the Holy Spirit. The devil gives thoughts, we take them captive. Or we destroy them, we smack them and put them down. After Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil come to him. And this wasn't something Jesus generated on his own. The Bible makes that totally plain. If you be the son of God, just command the stone to be turned to bread. He says, nope, out of here. But he used the word of God on him. I'm not going to quote that. And then he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, if you jump off and the angels will catch you. And Jesus give him another word. And, but Jesus did not self-generate those thoughts. You get it? He didn't self-generate those thoughts. But he defeated those thoughts through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the word. And the third temptation, he also did the same thing. And so Satan is a deceiver. We find in John 12, verse number 2, John 13, verse number 2. Uh, yeah, you got it right. Uh, 
Got to get the verses right or he'll be looking for one that's not on the list. It says this, and supper being ended. And the devil having already put into, what's that say? Read it out loud. Who put it there? 30 pieces of silver. He sold his life. But 30, how could the devil, how could the devil weed his way into his life to sell Jesus but 30 pieces of silver whom had cast out legions of demons, raised several dead, done all of this. Then he says, I'm going to. And so the devil put into his heart. Now, he could, you're not coming in. He could have used the word and run him away. And the devil would have had to find somebody else to use to do that. But he's going to find somebody because there's a prophecy that my own familiar friend has lifted up his heel. And Judas didn't have to be the one, but he let the devil make him the one. You're not destined to do bad. God has put his spirit inside of you. And if you listen to the Holy Spirit, you are destined to destroy and demolish every stronghold, every imagination that the devil comes at you. You're not destined to sin. And so, there's a process to sinning. James tells us about it by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let's just go through this slowly. Don't let anybody in this room, don't let anybody for generations and generations say, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God doesn't do that. God's not going to do that to you. But each one, me and you, we're only tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. Wow. So there gives me a reason right there to change my desires, renew my mind, renew my thoughts with God's Word and by the Holy Spirit. And then when we don't run those thoughts off, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. But let me tell you, I'm about to wrap it up. Natasha, would you come? We are more than conquerors. Say that. No weapon formed against you, me, or anybody else can prosper if we submit to God. Right. Give God praise. Isn't that powerful? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against us in judgment, we shall condemn it. I'm covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. You come to me, devil, tempted me, and I quoted verses to you and sent you fleeing. God has victory in view for me and for you. And he has that for the church at Ephesus. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Verse 13 of our text again, Ephesians 6. Take therefore the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Everybody in this room is going to have... A decision day. More than one in your life. An evil day when the devil is just coming after you like you have never been come after before. That you can withstand in the evil day. Principalities and powers. A host. There's more than one demon. A host of demons. A host of demons. A legion, a Roman legion, consisted of 6,000 people. And the man on the other side in the garden of Gadara, when Jesus, he's, when he asked the demon, what is your name? He says, we are legion, for we are many. And there was 2,000 pigs there. There was enough demons in that man that all 2,000 pigs got demon-possessed, and they run down into the ocean, and they drowned themselves. We are legion, we're many. Spiritual host. 10,000 demons can come after you, but you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can put them on the run, on the move. 
Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the word. Be strong in the Holy Spirit. Put on the whole armor of God. Next week, we're going to start into the armor, but put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the wiles, the trickiness, the schemes of the devil. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, not against other people, even though demons do use other people. He works through them. He even tries to get in our life. I had a meltdown at Sam's one day because I yielded my life, I yielded my emotions to the devil. I wanted, I, I wanted to jump on that. I wanted that guy just to bump me a little bit so I could, so I could nail him. That's demonic. 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 That's why whenever I go to somewhere, a store, I go to Walmart, just I park way down in the parking lot because it was all over a parking space. How many dumb things in life do we get run out over? The devil knows what buttons to push in our life. Some people don't would never have no problem with it. Some people never have no problem with sexual sins. So, some people have no problem with anger sins. And some people just have problem with pride sins. But we just need to be careful because the works of the flesh are listed out in Galatians in chapter number 5 and you can begin to get them at about verse number 16 and 17 walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh and he goes through the number there or the list that is there and if you do these things you shall not not 1% of those gets to heaven not 2% 3% but you do those things zero but there's a good thing about the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin That's why my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life today. After I had the meltdown at Sam's on a Saturday, I started to come to church Sunday morning and say, I'm resigning. I did not have so much pride. I could not have done that. God said, you don't do that. Don't do that. If you'll repent and genuinely say that you're sorry and strive that won't ever happen again in your life, I'll wash you and cleanse you. And that knowing the time, it's high time, church, it's high time. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes and the wiles of the devil. We are called to keep on standing and having done all to stand. Let's have a resolute spirit. Last verse, Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater. <laughs> oh, when I put that verse up there and I just scanned, I seen somebody just smile, just... They love that verse. Greater is he that's in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. From now to December the 31st, day after day, week after week, month after month, God has in view for me and for you not never a regress but he has in view for us stronger stronger and stronger progression 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 spiritual growth spiritual growth spiritual growth every head bowed in this house but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus.